In this lecture, I will be introducing the topic of hypotension. And in this and subsequent lectures, we'll be looking at the causes, the physiologic responses, and the treatment of hypotension. And I think the first question we need to ask is, how do we define hypotension? What is hypotension? Well, we have already learned that our normal arterial pressure is a pressure in an adult that is less than 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury. But what about the lower end? What, what pressure is really too low? Well, a clinical definition for abnormally low blood pressure or hypotension is a pressure, a systolic pressure of less than 90 and a diastolic pressure of less than 60 millimeters of mercury. But another caveat to this definition is that hypotension can be viewed as any abnormal decline from a person's normal average pressure. For example, let's say your arterial pressure is 180 over 20. When you stand up, your pressure will fall and then normally it recovers. And the pressure while you're standing is about the same as, as it is when you're lying down or, or seated. But a person who suffers from what we call orthostatic hypotension, that is a low blood pressure that results from changes in body posture, that person, when they suddenly stand up, if their systolic pressure decreases by 20 or more millimeters of mercury or their diastolic pressure decreases by, by 10 or more millimeters of mercury, that is considered orthostatic hypotension. Now, what are some of the mechanisms and causes of hypotension? This is a, a diagram that I have drawn. It's in the third edition of my textbook that helps to put together the basic mechanisms responsible for hypotension and associates them with clinical, with clinical conditions that cause these particular changes to occur in the heart and circulation that result in hypotension. So we know that arterial blood pressure is determined by the systemic vascular resistance of the body and by the cardiac output. And a decline in either cardiac output or systemic vascular resistance can lead to a fall in arterial blood pressure. So let's begin by looking at a fall in systemic vascular resistance. What are some conditions that can produce this change and lead to hypotension? Well, one is septic shock, where you get an infection within the blood that leads to a, an inflammatory response that does cause pronounced vasodilation in the body. Or anaphylactic shock it, it, as a part of an allergic response. Or neurogenic shock, where, where let's say there is spinal cord injury, and so vessels that are supplying, I mean, nerves that are supplying arterial vessels may be severed or damaged such that vascular tone is lost in blood vessels. Or it can be due to autonomic dysfunction. For example, a person who has type 2 diabetes and they develop what we call autonomic neuropathy, where their sympathetic system may not be able to regulate vascular resistance very well. So these are all factors that can lead to a fall in systemic vascular resistance and hypotension. Now, if we look over here at cardiac output, well, what will cause a fall in cardiac output? Well, cardiac output is determined by the heart rate times the stroke volume, the volume of blood ejected into the aorta with um, each beat. And one can have a condition where we have abnormally or an abnormal reduction in heart rate, and that would be a usually caused by arrhythmias. For example, sinus bradycardia, the sinus node in the right atrium is what governs the rate of the heartbeat. And if that's not working appropriately or it's under too much vagal tone, that can lead to what we call sinus bradycardia, which would reduce the rate, cardiac outputs reduced and lead to hypotension. We can have block within the conduction tissues from the atria and the ventricle such that the atria may be beating normally, but the ventricles are not beating because they don't receive the impulses from the atria. We call that AV nodal block. And so ventricular rate may be reduced. 
or we can have the condition of ventricular fibrillation where the ventricle undergoes spontaneous non-coordinated depolarizations and so there is no effective ventricular beat and heart rate effectively goes to zero. If we look at the other factor that determines cardiac output, that being stroke volume, well what can cause a fall in stroke volume? Well stroke volume, as you will come to understand, is determined by the inotropy of the heart, that is the force of contraction or the contractility of the myocardium, and if that is lost, if there is a decline in inotropy, that can lead to a decrease in stroke volume, cardiac output, and therefore hypotension. So what can cause a loss of inotropy? Well, certain forms of heart failure can do that. Or ischemic conditions in the heart, coronary artery disease. So the myocardium has insufficient oxygen supply, or it may be damaged by an acute blockage of the coronary arteries, leading to a myocardial infarction and a loss of tissue. In other words, dead ventricular tissue. So that heart will not be able to beat as well. Or it can also result from autonomic dysfunction because the autonomic nerves play a very important role in regulating the inotropy of the heart. And then the other mechanism that affects stroke volume is the preload on the heart. The preload on the heart is the filling of the ventricles. I mean, if the ventricles can't fill as well with blood, they're not going to pump out as much blood. So stroke volume falls, cardiac output falls, and hypotension can occur. So what are some causes of a fall in preload? Well, hypovolemic conditions caused by, let's say, hemorrhage or dehydration. Or you could have a redistribution of blood volume in the body. For example, when you stand up, and on the previous slide, we looked at the definition of orthostatic hypotension. So when you suddenly stand up, you have, you have a translocation of blood volume from the thoracic compartment down to the dependent limbs, the legs. And so the blood volume and pressure within the thorax, which is then sending that blood into the heart, it's reduced. So the preload on the heart or ventricular filling will be reduced. Another cause for a loss of preload is venous obstruction. Uh, this could be occurring, let's say, in a... In, in, in the pulmonary circuit, or it could be occurring in the vena cava. For example, a woman who is in late-term pregnancy may not be able to lie down on her back comfortably because when she does so, the weight of the, of the baby will compress the vena cava. And that venous uh, up, uh, obstruction, or compression in this case, will cause a decreased filling of the ventricles and hypotension can occur. Or a decrease in preload can also occur with arrhythmias. You know, arrhythmias is, are really an electrical phenomenon, but if the atria do not beat normally, let's say they're undergoing fibrillation, this uncoordinated sort of asynchronous depolarizations and contractions, they're not going to be able to contract and to fill the ventricles as well. Or if you have tachycardia, very high heart rates, you have less time for filling the ventricles. And that can lead to a decrease in preload, stroke volume, cardiac output, and cause hypotension. Let's look at another definition because in, in uh, this lecture and in the subsequent lectures, I'll be talking about a shock condition, circulatory shock. Well, what is shock? Well, shock can be defined as an insufficient systemic organ perfusion. Now, when you have inadequate perfusion of organs, that reduced blood flow leads to a reduction in oxygen delivery to the tissues. So the tissues become oxygen starved, and that can result in end organ dysfunction, which is a hallmark of, of shock, not just hypotension, but the hypotension is severe enough where it leads to end organ dysfunction. Now, for a number of years now, it's been common clinically, at least in the clinical literature in particular, to, to look at shock and divide it into f at least four major categories. One being hypovolemic, or reduced blood volume. Cardiogenic shock, which would be 
uh, shock of cardiac, cardiogenic or origin. An example of that would be acute heart failure. A uh, third category would be obstructive shock. An obstructive shock would be vascular obstruction or cardiac compression. And then the fourth one is what we call distributive shock, which is a vasodilatory form of shock. And this can be caused by uh, SIRS or a systemic inflammatory response syndrome, which can be further caused by, let's say, sepsis. Um, so bacterial infection within the blood, or it could be anaphylactic or neurogenic shock. These will all result in a distributive type of vasodilatory uh, status in the body and hypotension. In this table, what I'm trying to give you is an overview of three different types of shock that we'll be looking at in subsequent lectures. That will be hemorrhagic shock, which is a form of hypovolemic shock, cardiogenic shock or shock, shock that, are, that originates from the heart itself, and septic shock or distributive shock. And in this table, I want to present to you an overview of what are the major differences and some of the similarities between these different forms of shock. So let's look at hemorrhagic shock first of all. Hemorrhagic shock or hypovolemic shock by, by its name results from a decrease in volume, a loss of blood or loss of fluid. And so what is triggering this shock is a decrease in blood volume. That leads to decreased in central venous pressure which reduces the filling pressure or the preload of the heart. That leads to a reduction in stroke volume and cardiac output. Furthermore, in hemorrhagic shock, we find that systemic vascular resistance can become greatly elevated. And that elevation in systemic vascular resistance is due to baroreceptor reflexes and humoral factors that are activated also that lead to a vasoconstricted state. Now let's compare that with cardiogenic shock. So cardiogenic shock is originating within the heart itself, so it, it's related to a depressed heart function. So under with this condition, we will have as a primary response is a decrease in cardiac output. Well, that decrease in cardiac output what it will do is lead to a backing up of blood on the venous side so we can have greatly elevated venous pressures. In this case, it's central venous pressure backing up uh, before the right ventricle and atrium. So increase in CVP. We will then have also an increase in SVR and that is largely, at least initially, uh, neurogenic because of autonomic activation that occurs from baroreceptor reflex, but then also humoral factors like the RAS system that will increase the SVR. And the RAS system, when it is activated, will also act on the kidneys to um, retain fluid, sodium and fluid, to increase the blood volume. So in cardiogenic shock, you see that it's just the opposite in terms of what happens to volume and to venous pressure. And finally, let's look at septic shock. Septic shock results from primarily vascular dilation. And so in the early stages of septic shock, you have a tremendous loss of vascular tone. The blood vessels dilate, so SVR falls. We also will see that there is a decrease in blood volume. We're not hemorrhaging, but what happens is that in septic shock, as we will learn in a subsequent lecture, the vasculature becomes very permeable and so fluid leaks out into the interstitial space. And so you actually have a contraction of the blood volume. So blood volume is reduced. It leads to a fall in central venous pressure. We also find that in the early stages of septic shock, we often have 
what we call a hyperdynamic phase in terms of cardiac function where the cardiac output is above normal, hyperdynamic, it is stimulated. But then as one progresses into later stages of septic shock, we find that this is followed by cardiac depression and a fall in cardiac output. The SVR is decreased, as I've already mentioned, because of systemic vasodilation. And also, as we'll talk about in a subsequent lecture, this can also, in the later stages of shock, lead to, at least regionally, if not systemically, to vascular plugging that, re that increases the resistance perhaps within specific tissues and organs or regions with uh, regions of tissues within those organs. And that, and that leads to a, a microcirculatory disarrangement and an and alteration in oxygen supply to the tissue. Well, this is the last slide for this particular lecture. And I want to point out to you that by understanding the pathophysiology of shock, that will help you to understand the signs and symptoms of shock. What are some of these signs and symptoms of shock? Well, confusion or lack of alertness is a sign or symptom. And that and sometimes loss of consciousness, that's, re that's um, the result of altered cerebral function. Brain function is altered because of hypotension leading to decreased oxygen delivery to the brain. Another sign and symptom is a rapid heart rate, and that's due to reflexes that are activated during shock to stimulate the heart. A weak pulse, well, the weak pulse occurs because of a high heart rate and also decreased stroke volume associated, depending upon the type of shock associated with, let's say, a hypovolemic state and decreased preload. So the stroke volume is reduced by the heart and that leads to a weakened pulse. Sweating occurs because of sympathetic activation within the body. Patients in most forms of shock will have pale skin, cool hands, and feet. And that's because the skin undergoes vasoconstriction, and so with less blood flow to the skin, the hands and the feet will be cool to touch. And that will occur in these different forms of shock except for distributive shock, because distributive shock is a vasodilatory type of shock, as we've already um, looked at. Rapid breathing can occur in response to or during a shock condition because respiratory activity is stimulated. And oftentimes the, the kidneys will respond by decreasing their urine output or kidneys going into complete failure and, and having no urine output. 